Hi guys, I'm Zita, editor of Military History Quarterly Magazine. Have you heard of the new TV series called Rogue Heroes? Love it or hate it, it has been raising a lot of interest in and controversy about the SAS recently. Today, I'm speaking with author and SAS historian Gavin Mortimer about his new book, The Phony Major, which is also causing some controversy. He re-examines the legends behind two very different SAS figures, David Sterling and Robert Blair Main, also known as Patty Main. Okay, so first of all, can you tell me uh, what inspired you to embark on the journey to write this book? Well, it, it, it stretches back uh, 24 years to 1998. That was when I first uh, interviewed uh, a wartime SAS veteran, Dr. Uh, Malcolm Pladel, who was the SAS doctor in the desert in 1942, and whose book, Born of the Desert, um, in my mind, remains the definitive account of a wartime SAS. And I was wanting to, uh, as well as military history, my other great love is rugby. And so put those two together, what do you get? Paddy <laughs> May. Yeah. Um, and I was wanting to write a, a biography of, of Paddy May. Um, so I went to see Malcolm and his eyes, he wasn't very well at the time, um, but his eyes lit up when I mentioned Paddy May and he said what a wonderful man he was and and just what a, what a great soldier. But, but also, and this is very important, I think, when, when talking about Paddy May, in, in his book, Born of a Desert, you know, Malcolm Pladel went on to have a very successful medical career after the war. He was a very refined, intelligent man. And he... He, he gave the, the shrewdest, most perceptive and rounded description of Paddy May, Paddy May in my opinion. And he brought out his, his, his other side. It's, um, yes, complex man, but very intelligent, very sensitive, and with this almost maternal instinct for the men under his command. So anyway, I, I saw Malcolm, and then the next chap I saw was Donnie Cooper who was in the SAS, one of the originals in 1941, went on many operations with Johnny Cooper and was in the regiments until 1959. And we struck up a bit of a rapport. I was in living in Paris. He was in uh, Portugal, two exiled Englishmen. Um, and it was actually Johnny after a while who said, why don't you write a book about the wartime SAS through the eyes of the men? There's been half a dozen books written by officers, but nothing really given a good account of the men i can be your your lead if you like and true to his word johnny introduced me to the regimental association who've always been very supportive and, and very helpful and and that's how it started they sent out letters to their uh, wartime veterans and i must have had about 70 75 who replied the majority of whom were working class lads who'd never talked before were in the home straight, if I can put it like that, wanted to talk and did talk. And it was a wonderful two years of my life. We're, we're going back now, so this is 2002, 2003. Um, and so that's, that's really when my um, obsession, and it, it has become an obsession with, with the, not just the SAS, other wartime special forces. I've written about Merrill's Marauders and the Long Range Desert Group. But it, it began uh, in, in that period. I mean, the, the culmination, if you like, is my latest book, a biography of, of uh, David Sterling, <laughs> not wholly flattering, the phony major. Um, would you say that your perceptions about Sterling have changed over time? I mean, when you yeah. first started doing this, where, did you see him in a different light, maybe? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, when I began, I bought into the, the, the myth that was really laid down by David Sterling in his 1958 uh, really semi-autobiographical account of the Phantom Major, written with um, the American author uh, Virginia Cowles. Um, now, very important that date, 1958, mm -hmm. um, for two reasons. One, it was at a time when the, the, the sun really was setting on the British Empire. We had the Suez Crisis, the... Um, the, the empire was breaking up, more and more countries were declaring their independence, morale was at a low, low point, and then suddenly this, this Elizabethan devil-may-care buccaneer, the Phantom Major, came along to sort of remind us of our, of our glory days. But more pertinently, 
1955, Paddy Main was killed in a car crash. And so there was no run really left um, because the, the, the three main figures in the formation of the SAS um, were um, Sterling, Paddy Main and Jock Lewis. And uh, Jock Lewis was killed at the end of 41. Now Main was dead. So there was nothing to stop Sterling reinterpreting the history of the regiment. And that's what he did. So he turned himself, really, it was a protest um, over about three decades from, from 58 to, to up to when he died in 1990. He became Paddy Main, this fearless guerrilla genius. And Paddy Main became Sterling, this dark, brooding, misogynistic, depressive, which wasn't Main. Um, it was David Sterling. And uh, so, and, and David Sterling was also, don't get me wrong, physically very brave, full of good ideas, but fairly inept as a guerrilla fighter. Uh, the antithesis of, of uh, Paddy Main, who was, who was a genius. I mean, I don't use that word lightly. Um, and, uh, and Paddy Main never took Sterling that seriously uh, as, a, as a special forces soldier. And this really rankled with, with David Sterling. Uh, and if you look at the um, those early operations, there was St uh, Paddy Main on his first operation, uh, first raid on Tamit. He destroyed 24 aircraft and shot up a, um, a barrack full of uh, enemy airmen. Uh, then he returned to the same airfield a couple of weeks later, destroyed 27 aircraft. Meanwhile, Sterling, on his first raid, uh, cert, he fell into an enemy foxhole. And on the second raid, he wandered into a... Uh, a minefield. And when Johnny Cooper alerted him to this in a whisper, sir, sir, we're in a minefield, he stood up and bellowed, what? What's that, Cooper? So that really, to me, sort of embodies David Sterling, willing but not very able. So so over the, the, the course of 20 years, as I matured as a writer and also as a, as a man, I suppose, I was in my 20s when I started out on this, uh, this odyssey, I really began, and, and the more and more I looked at uh, the archive, spoke to people and reflected, I realised that Sterling had pulled the wool over our eyes. Now, my eureka moment probably was in 2014, when I spent a couple of days with Mike Lofty Carr. He was the, um, the first navigator, which was a rank, in the Long Range Desert Group in Yeomanry Patrol. And Mike, one wonderful man, shrewd, very intelligent, unorthodox. He was fairly scathing about David Sterling. In fact, Sterling had tried to headhunt him into the SAS in early 42. And, and Mike had said, no, no chance. You know, he, he, he considered Sterling slapdash, um, lazy, and, and somebody who cut corners. Um, and, and so I suppose hearing that from someone as, as um, respected and as knowledgeable as Mike really gave me the courage. And that's a word I use to, to take on the myth of the Phantom Major. I think it's helpful to have that perspective of, you know, of being a historian and being so engaged with your subject and being able to change your views over time. I know in my own experience, um, researching Field Marshal Rommel. I mean, there are things about him that my perceptions about him have changed over time as I've studied more and more. So it's really interesting to hear from you about that, um, you know, about realizing that Sterling had kind of created this Batman and Robin sort of mm. myth. And I don't think that the role of Robin suits Patty Maine very well. That, that's <laughs> why there are some things that just don't really seem to add up about that. Um, I know in your book, you talked a little bit about the British class system playing into that a little bit. How, how is that? Yeah, I mean, that, that is a very important factor. Firstly, the, the class, because another, um, ju just to briefly mention, another very important figure who I bring out in, in the, the book, The Phony Major, is, is David's big brother, Bill Sterling. Um, and he was really the brains of the SAS. He was uh, four years older than David, uh, much more balanced, much more rounded, much more mature, um, uh, married with a, um, a, a young son. And so he was he was very much in the background, but both of them were very well connected. Now, 
um, the Honourable Mrs. Sterling, their mother, uh, was one of the leading socialites of that the interwar era. She was a friend of Queen Mary, um, and she she had prime ministers to tea at their vast country estate in Scotland. So those connections were very important. Um, but but also uh, they were important after the war in in effectively covering up for Sterling. Um, and oh, the, you know the. But, uh, the Shakespeare, the lady doth protest too much. You, you, you get a sense of that when you read very distinguished people who I have a great deal of respect for, Fitzroy MacLean, um, uh, George Jellicoe, who, both of whom were, were, in the, uh, were in the SAS. They, they talked of Sterling after the war as, as they added to the, they added to the, to the myth, um, if you like. And, um, uh, and they said some things, Fitzroy MacLean, for example, in his eulogy at Sterling's funeral in 1990, said that um, uh, Sterling, in effect, was the pioneer of special forces in, in North Africa, and he had the idea to hit the enemy miles behind their lines. That was the long-range desert group that was formed a year, a year before um, the SAS. And they, although they're not known... Um, mainly now for a rare reconnaissance, they beat reconnaissance, brilliant reconnaissance. They also did carry out raids and they attacked uh, at Merzak in January 41, an Italian fort, and drove, drove on to an airdrome um, uh, firing from their vehicle. So really, they, that's what we associate the SAS in the desert with, but that was pioneered by the Long Range Desert Group. So there's this element among, the, among Sterling's upper class chums, and he was very guilty during the war. He recruited officers to his regiment, not on their competency, but, but on their breeding. Were they the right sort of chap? Um, and so you had some spectacular failures. Randolph Churchill, Winston's son, was in the SAS. And it was just a disaster. And I spoke to several veterans who said most of the time he was drunk. Um, and um, but, but Sterling, you see, was, was running it, uh, the SAS, as a, almost like a, a gentleman's club. And um, it, it's very important to state that the, the SAS really only began to evolve after Sterling's capture in January 43, when Paddy Main took control of it. And he, he brought discipline and organisation to it. Um, but so, the, so the sort of Sterling was a minor aristocrat. He was able to get away with that. Also, one has to remember, um, even in the the late 50s and 60s, Britain was still a very deferential country. If you were a working class chap, you were never going to question the word of someone like David Sterling. You knew your place. So he was able to, to create this legend of a, of a phantom major, knowing that none of the working class men who served under him would ever challenge him. Mm. And why do you think that it's taken so long for people and, and also in your book to try and reevaluate the role of Patty Maine? I mean, why has there been this relative silence um, about, about him? That's a very good question. And I'm, I'm a little disappointed. I, it's six months since the book came out. No one's refuted any of my arguments, my analysis. I've been criticized within um, certain circles in the British uh, military establishment. Uh, for writing the book, for more or less sp spilling the secret. Um, and, and they've admitted my critics, OK, he had shortcomings, Sterling, but they didn't need to be aired. Well, my argument is, my counter argument is, well, Paddy Main has had his reputation trashed for the best part of three decades, since the 1980s, when a book called um, Rogue Warrior was published and made some fairly um, unsubstantiated and, and malicious allegations about Paddy Main. Now, interestingly, who wrote the foreword to that book? David Sterling. David Sterling was always very subtle at denigrating Paddy Main's character. He wouldn't do it openly. He was more sort of a nudge, nudge, wink, wink sort of a assassin. Um, and so that's, that's um, uh, and that's my, the, the, the BBC series, Rogue Heroes, which uh, I enjoyed, it's entertaining. Um, it states that it's, it's based on the truth. It's probably about a third accurate. But my one real gripe is it perpetuates 
the the myth of Paddy Main is this wild, barely controllable, drunken Irishman. And again, that, that going back to the class thing, you know, it, there there is uh, an element um, within um, certainly during the war uh, who looked down on Irishmen. You know, the you know the, the upper class English chaps, and Paddy Main resented quite understandably understandably not only resented it but didn't think much of these upper class officers himself he thought they were there purely because of who they knew most of the time he was right um and so i think again that's um there hasn't been a proper uh defense of paddy may uh and i'm pleased to see that his niece um fiona ferguson in the british newspaper um today has said that uh criticized his portrayal in the um, in the BBC series, saying he was far more than just some wild drunken Irishman, um, and uh, as indeed he was, the, the the officers that I spoke to, uh, who'd served with him in the SS, and the men, um, spoke very highly, obviously of his courage, but also his tactical genius, um, and his he, he wasn't he wasn't gung ho. He he assessed risk very carefully and would never commit his men to something that he hadn't weighed up the pros and the cons. Um, but that's not portrayed in, in, in the BBC drama where you just see him sort of wanting to fight everyone on and off the battlefield. Um, so uh, th that's really, uh, I think, something that I'm keen to stress about the phony major is that, yes, I'm critical of Sterling, um, but I, the, I back up my criticism with plenty of of evidence and quotes, yeah. um, but but also I use quotes and evidence to, to demolish a lot of the nonsense that's been written about Paddy Main. Oh, and what would you would you have anything in particular to say to uh, SAS veterans who are kind of disgruntled? I mean, I personally reading the book, I I see that you've used a lot of evidence, you know, to to back up your claims and also. I mean, it, it's not against the SAS in any way. Um, uh, so, like, would you have anything to that you would like to say to people who just see the title phony major and are getting a little bit riled up? Yeah, I, I was a very good question, and, and I would. I'm very, uh, I, I, very respectful um, about the regiment. It's extraordinary how, in such a short space of time, it's become one of the one of the finest. Uh, uh, regiments in in the world and um i would say that i you have to be open-minded about history we, we you alluded to that earlier in our conversation that sometimes not open-minded uh, but, but also not just open-minded but also old and courageous to admit sometimes we got things wrong and history is about reassessing and reinterpreting and let's not forget david sterling reinterpreted he was the first to reinterpret the history of the wartime SAS in his book, The Phantom Major. Um, the Germans, incidentally, never called him the Phantom Major. That was his friend Randolph Churchill for, fa uh, for propaganda purposes. And really, the only person who called David Sterling the Phantom Major was David Sterling. Um, and so I am, re I am reinterpreting the reinterpreter, if you like, and, and actually getting back to the true story. That the, the David Sterling for over half a century has has been able to get away with with his own version of events, which are just not true, and 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 that and that's why I say I just encourage people to read the book with an open mind because my the, the evidence is there, and in fact a lot of the the evidence is is, is already out there. I, I mined the archives uh, and I used quotes from people who officers who served with Sterling at GHQ, exasperated at his you know, slapdash methods. And George, if I can just give one example, George Davy, who was director of military operations in Cairo, he warned him um, in that final patrol in um, 19, uh, January 1943, when he was going into Tunisia. Um, George Davy said to him, this is in his unpublished memoir, he told me of the route he was going to take, close round the flank of a mouth line. I said he was going into an area where the natives were known to be hostile and that he would be captured. I suggested he should take a wider sweep. However, he was obstinate as usual and they got him. Mm. That to me sums up 
David Sterling. And I, I can't see how anyone can really criticize me for, <laughs> for, for telling that story. That, that, you know, he, he was captured because of his own arrogance and obstinacy. And, um, and I interviewed uh, three soldiers who were with him in that final patrol, two of them, Donny Cooper and, and Mike Sadler, uh, were able to escape through great presence of mind, but a third, Red Reddington, wasn't. And really because of Sterling's obstinacy, he spent two and a half years in a prison of war camp. I, I do admit that I'm also disappointed with rogue heroes for taking that kind of you know, rough and tumble, drunkard approach to um, Patty Main. I, I just don't really think it's fair. And certainly um, when I've read various different accounts about him, he has always struck me as a very literary, intelligent man, um, someone who I think has gone unrecognized in a lot of ways. Do you think that there's any chance that he could be recognized more widely in society now? I mean, do you think there's any chance for a reckoning, uh, any kind of recognition for him after all these years? Well, not not on the basis of a um, not on the back of a rogue heroes program. I'm afraid no, because as you said, that just perpetuates perpetuates the. Uh, the, the the wild man myth um there are some you know in my book the phony major there's um that that gives a, a much truer broader and, and nuanced depiction of paddy main there's a a good biography by a chap called hamish ross ross 20 years ago which is good damian lewis um is another author who's written um a will of paddy main so it's 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 the, the books are out there but again it comes back to what we just said one has to be broad-minded and open-minded. And it is quite interesting. So I think, <laughs> to me, an important uh, point to make, I'm not from the upper class. Um, and it's been quite interesting to see the, the establishment newspapers in the United Kingdom have ignored my book. Mm. Um, normally, a book like this would be reviewed. They review, um, I won't mention them, um, um, but uh, they, they normally review military titles. They've completely avoided mine. Why? Well, who knows? Um, it, it's been reviewed in other publications. Sol David, the historian, gave it a very good review. And and, and I admire those historians, for, again, because they're, they're, they are sort of going against the, um, the, the orthodoxy, if you like. Um, and, but the establishment newspapers have, have given it a wide berth. And they're perfectly, perfectly happy to run these scuffle of stories about Paddy Main. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's an ongoing battle, but it's it's one that I'm um, determined to keep fighting because Paddy Main was an exceptional man and he deserved better than to have his reputation trashed. I'm glad that you've taken up his sword. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy to hear that.